Alrighty, yo, what is going on with your boy, Mr. DDG94, back with another reaction video. Today we're going to react to rap songs that were obviously made to be mainstream part three. Uh, yeah, yeah, shout out to the homie Amir, man. Make sure y'all go subscribe to his channel. Bring the likes up, bring the views up, and comments up, subscribers up, and all that good shit. And uh, yeah, man, without further ado, man, let's get right into it. Uh... Rap songs that were obviously made to be mainstream part three. Hmm, let's get it. All right, so boom, we're back at it with part three of songs that were obviously made to be mainstream. Both part one and two are super old at this point. Part one, I made in April 2019, and part two, I made in February 2020, but I had to re-upload it in March of that year. So dang, already nearly four years have passed since the last entry. But it's all good because I have five more examples. For this video, I'm going to be showing you guys hip hop records that everything about the song, you can just tell that the artist made it wanting it to be a big record. Whether it's because it had a super poppy sound, the meaning behind the track was something generic and motivational, just the overall feel of the song, you just know that the artist wasn't going to have this be a deep cut and that they were striving for it to appeal to the casual listener. Keep in mind that I'm not saying that this makes the song whack. I'm just pointing them out how some songs, anyone who's heard it can tell that it being a big single was clearly the intention. Check out part one and two. They will be linked in the description and pinned comment, but let's get to it. Well, to... it just wasn't a good time. This song could have definitely been a banger, bro. Cause I fuck with this song. I ain't gonna lie to you. I fuck with this song, nigga. I fuck with this song, nigga. I ain't gonna even hold you, nigga. <laughs> I fuck with this song, but it just wasn't a good time. Chris Brown was going through a situation. Uh, 2009 was just not that great of a year. It just wasn't that strong of a year so far at that point. Well, I take that back. The summer was strong. When we got to fall and winter, yo, yo, the music was like, like, yo, like, get, like, Yo, we need something new. We need something now. And this this just wasn't a good time to put this song out. That's all I'm going to say. Definitely could have been a banger if they held on to it and put it out like probably, I don't know, psh, a year later or something like that. But eh, it is what it is. So Joel Santana is one of those rappers where I enjoy purposely disrespecting him, even though he's done nothing to me. The reason behind this is because from what I've heard from him, he's always been a mediocre rapper that has some bright spots, you know, some fire moments here and there. But overall, he's a very basic rapper to me. And yet there are a lot of people who think he is cold and they always try to tell me, oh, you just ain't heard. The who the fuck said that? Whoever said that, sir, you need help. <laughs> Whoever said that, you need help. Hell no. Nah. Who the fuck said that? <laughs> Hear me and hear me good, nigga. I'm here to double down. That shit is a, a two pack of ass. The fuck are you talking about? That shit stinks. John in Tennessee, go ahead. What you want to say? That shit is fucking trash, dog. Get the fuck off the airwaves. Oh, come uh. on, man. Who the fuck said this nigga was cold? I ain't never heard nobody say, yo, Joel said Tanner might be top five. Who mans is this? Who says that? <laughs> The right stuff yet you big time tripping if you think you wells is a basic rapper he got some hits boy what you mean i also had to start pronouncing his name correctly because one time in a past video when i was calling him jules i had an old dude say look look at you look at you trying to talk about Joel santana you can't even say his name right it's jewels not jules so let me say his name right i ain't trying to make the geriatric niggas mad so Joel santana has never been impressive to me and some of the stuff he has that people do hype up i don't think are good like his verse on Lil Wayne's You Ain't Got Nothing is one of the most overrated verses on that Carter 3 album. I get money out the ass, that's some expensive shit. People who think that line is fire, y'all scare me. I don't think he's garbage, I just haven't been blown away by what I've heard from him. In December 2009, Jules released another single for his shelved Born to Lose, Built to Win album. This album was never released, but the reason I said another single was because there was already a couple of other ones released for the album. There was a song called The Second Coming and another track called Mixing Up the Medicine featuring Yellow Wolf. The third single released after the second coming and mixing up the medicine was this song Back to the Crib with Chris Brown. And it was easily the most popular of the three. And for those of you that remember, Jules was on Chris Brown's very first song. That run it track originally was just Chris, but like two weeks after the original track came out, the studios added Jules to it. 
I don't know how he was able to get a Jewel Santana feature on his first song, but this is Jewel Santana we're talking about here. So I'm sure it didn't cost that much. So <laughs> Fuzzy returned the favor for Jewels on this track. And if you peep a moment ago, I said that this song came out in December 2009. 2009 was probably the worst year in Chris Brown's life. This was the same year where the Rihanna incident happened and his graffiti album, the album that's widely considered his worst one, had just came out a few weeks prior to this collab. So this collab came out at a very interesting time. The president of Def Jam, L.A. Reid, wanted Trey Songz to do the hook instead in order to avoid any public scrutiny from collabing with Chris, but Jules wasn't trying to hear it since Chris is his boy. Back to the Crib is a super basic song about Lil Shorty checking me out, she's sexy as hell, I'm about to holler at her, take her back. No, Joel said, tell them make this song basic as fuck. Chris actually is the MVP of this song. You should know me, I can see myself in your future, that's hood, OG. I'm in my mind now, choosing your girl said you won't try to leave it. I'm feeling it, yeah. <laughs> Come on, dog. Chris, Chris had the yo. Chris was the highlight of this song, bro. Anything that had to do with Joel's is just like, can we get back to Chris Brown, please? Please, can we get back to Chris Brown? I don't want to hear this, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> Hear me and hear me good, nigga. I'm here to double down. That shit is a, a two-pack of ass. <laughs> the fuck are you talking about? That shit stinks. I was done. I was like, please go back to Chris Brown. This shit ain't working out. I'm about to hit the skip button. Back to the spot. It's not a bad record. It's enjoyable. It's just a super simple record. If this was a higher tier rapper that made this, I would look at them like they were a sellout and they just clearly wanted to make a cash grab to sell records. But I feel like this is right up Santana's alley. Runway walk, beauty queen face, video body, see the curves in that shape. And everything her mama gave her, she know how to shake, thicker than a milkshake, and I'm trying to get a taste. I can't even say that Jules lowered his standards for this song. This is exactly what he's capable of. He knew what he was doing by putting the R&B dude on the hook. If Chris wasn't going through his nonsense during this year, this could have been a bigger record. But either way, let's keep it New York here. There is way less people that would care about this song if Chris wasn't on it. Oh, Lord. I hate this song. I hate this song. This song is ugh. Ugh. Where my, nah, where that? Where that? <laughs> where that? This song, ugh. Ugh. Brother, ugh. What's that? What's that, brother? I'm definitely not trying to, ugh. Get, get this song the fuck out of here, dog. Oh man, the memories I have with this song right here. If there's one song that sticks out to me from any of Nas's mid to late 2000s albums, it's this song Hero with Kerry Hilson. And the reason that it is is because this song was on the soundtrack to Midnight Club Los Angeles, one of my favorite racing games of all time. I think I I've never played this game, sadly. I still got this game. Hold on. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I know I still got this shit. Hold on. I, there it go right here. What you mean, boy? What you mean? What you mean, boy? Another fifteen dollars on the Xbox uh, store right now, right? This, this is this is this is fifteen dollars on the Xbox store right now. I can literally go to my Xbox. Matter of fact, hold on real quick. I can show you real quick. Hold on, hold on real quick. I can show you. I can show you better. Than I can tell you. <laughs> To show you, <laughs> oh lord, oh no, oh lord, I can show you, but I can tell you. Ah, oh, let's see here. Uh, midnight club, midnight club, midnight club. There you go. Look, fifteen dollars right now, or oh wow, I should get Game Pass so I could finally play this game for the first time. Oh wow, maybe maybe I'll consider it. Yeah. Now I gotta pay my rent. My rent is more important. I'd rather pay my rent than be uh, yeah. But you see, it's 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 well, it's 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 nine dollars with Game Pass, but it's still fifteen. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what you mean? What 
you mean, boy? What you mean? I used to drive to this song all the time on Midnight Club. I can't lie, doing a honey on the freeway listening to Nas is only something that would happen in a video game. Outside of that, if you playing Nas while driving in real life, you're weird as hell. This song was released as the lead single, so oh yeah, he for sure wanted to get this out there. The lead single to his 2008 album, Untitled. And Hero has always been the most known song on this tape. Do y'all know those type of songs where it be one verse that's way better than the other ones? Like the other verses aren't bad or nothing, but there's this one that's so good that you can tell the artist was on a different type of time when they recorded this one. That's the third verse of Hero. The third verse of this song is actually one of the best verses I've ever heard from Nas. The first two verses, he raps well, but overall, it's just him talking about, I've always been a boss, I'm suave with the ladies, I'll tear through your whole crew if anybody tries to test me, I went from dreaming in the hood to now people gotta shut down their story when I shop there, I made it for all my homies that didn't. Like, the first two verses are really nothing that crazy, but then for the third verse, Nas goes in depth about the controversy he was getting into in regards to the album title. So Untitled was originally supposed to be called the N-word with the hard E-R, like spelled exactly how the slur is spelled. L.A. Reid, who was mentioned earlier as the president of Dev Jam, was fine with the album being called The Slur with the hard E-R. Doug Morris, who was the chairman of Universal Music Group, he was fine with the hard E-R title. Everything was set for this to be the name of Nas' ninth album. Unfortunately, what happened was, outside of receiving criticism from the NAACP and civil rights activists, there was a politician named Hakeem Jeffries who started pulling hella strings. Jeffries got into contact with some higher ups who was in charge of UMG's funding and their budget, and he essentially gave UMG an ultimatum that unless Nas changed the title, UMG was going to get millions of dollars pulled from their funding. Once in other words, nigga, this album ain't selling unless we get rid of that. So what we gonna do? <laughs> in other words, nigga, you lost your rabbit ass mind. You think we finna sell? How the fuck we gonna sell this? You think white people gonna buy this up? You think this is con? You think this the type of controversy that sells? You really think that, huh? Cops, wait. Take a few steps to go. You ain't got the answers, man. You ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers, Sway. Kanye, I've been doing this more than you. Doing what? You ain't got. Come on, chill out. You ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers. That whole situation happened. Both L.A. Reid and Doug Morris went to Nas and essentially went, eh, "All right, my hearty are. We ain't about to give you that much free will. You're gonna have to change the title with this." And thus, it was labeled Untitled. The third verse of Hero, Nas touches on everything I just said. Is universal apartheid? I'm hogtied the corporate side, blocking y'all from going to stores and buying it. He spins this verse saying how he's always been a rebel that went against the grain, but now he's being censored in the biggest way possible. Higher ups forcing him to change the name of his album is going to send a bad message to younger people that they won't be able to express their art as much as they want to. So entitled it is, I never changed nothing, but people will remember this. If Nas can't say it, think about these talented kids with new ideas being told what they can and can't spit. This verse and the hook by Kerry Hilson are easily the highlights of this song. Shout out to Polo the Don for the production too. He also produced Back to the Crib, funny enough. A song that sounded like this, I'm not surprised Nas pushed this as a radio record. This a this a top five Jay Z song. I don't care what anybody say. This a top five Jay Z song. Top five dead and alive. This is a top five Jay Z song, nigga. Don't tell me no different, bro. Top five. Top five, nigga. Fight me. <laughs> Fight me, nigga. I dare you, bro. It's gonna be Boogie Cup. No, 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 One no. Deal. No, 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 yeah. no. 19 Don't million. Make, One no. year, Boogie Cup. Oh, 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 oh. Fuck all that! Nah, I don't fuck all that. <laughs> Top five Jay Z song. I don't care what anybody say, nigga. This song right here has got to be one of the most blatant attempts at a mainstream song in hip hop history. You Jay Z fans out there, especially the OGs who were around during this time and lived through it, they will tell you they saw it with their own eyes and heard it with their own ears. Sunshine was one of the most obvious times where a rapper tried to change his image and style up and it made people look at the rapper and go, What the hell are you doing? So Sunshine was the lead single to Jay's second album, In My Lifetime Volume 1, which is an album that Jay himself has admitted he isn't that fond of. This was the first project he made after Biggie passed away. And so he was understandably affected by that, so much that he has gone on to say he wasn't even having fun when making this album. In January 2022, Jay said on Twitter that he's still haunted to this day when it comes to this album because he thinks about what could have been and that he's a little embarrassed with how the project turned out. 
Reasonable Doubt was a fantastic introduction, and he showed the world how a new young dude from New York was ready to burst onto the hip-hop scene with his more street, mafia-style drug talk raps. But going into his second album, all of that flew out the window when he released Sunshine as the first song. Everything about this song, from the chorus, the toned down simple lyrics, and especially the music video. Jay-Z completely tried to change from a mafia type street rapper to a shiny suit, big lights, fancy colors, goofy looking rapper. The reason he did this was because Diddy effect. The Diddy effect. The Diddy effect. And you gotta tell Diddy no. You gotta to tell him no. Cause P. Diddy be wanting the body. And you gotta tell him no. You got to tell him no. I did. You can't be at, you can't be playing around at these Diddy parties cause you end up doing shit like this. Even if it is a top five song. Cause this was still the bad boy era of hip hop. Puffy and Mace were still running things, and everyone remembers looking at their television and seeing how eccentric and energetic Puffy used to be before he started throwing those wild parties. So Jay-Z and the label looked at Diddy and went, oh, this what the people like? Oh yeah, we on. Since he wanted to get a huge radio hit, Jay wanted to imitate this same thing. It didn't work from a commercial or critical standpoint. Commercially, Sunshine only made it to number 95 on the Billboard 100 chart and only stayed there for two weeks. His earlier tracks like Ain't No Nigga and Can't Knock the Hustle with Mary J were bigger than this. Critically, a lot of Jay-Z fans would tell you this is one of his worst songs because it was such an obvious attempt to try to mimic the popular style at the time instead of Jay just being himself and doing what the people already knew and loved him for. Dame Dash has mentioned in interviews that he didn't want to do the music video because he thought it was too silly and goofy. Overall, Sunshine has always been kind of a dark spot in Jay's catalog. I haven't talked about what the song meaning is because there's really nothing special. Just Jay-Z and Foxy Brown portraying as romantic partners and they're rapping about loyalty, love, and trust between each other. Essentially what it takes to be the other one's sunshine. If I need it with you, give me your kidneys. For sure, catch a case, you catch it with me. For sure, upon your jury to come and get me. You better know, catch me with a chick, forgive me. Now that, I don't know. This sounds like something Jewel Santana would make. But even with everything I just said, I fucking love this song, dog. <laughs> yes, sir! Would y'all believe this was one of my top most listened to songs in 2023? I was singing this song nonstop through most of the year. As silly and ridiculous as this song is, I love the campiness of it. I always thought the singer of this chorus was a female until I found out it was actually Babyface. I'm really not trying to be rude when I say this, but Babyface sounds like a woman on here. The disrespect, Babyface is top five, bro. Babyface is top five, bro. You know the songs this man done made, produce? Come on, dog. That's the disrespect. Some of y'all, when it comes to this record, may be exactly like me. You don't give a damn if it was a blatant cash grab. It's still an enjoyable song. To make sure that you're one of a kind and you deserve to be my sunshine. Instant banger, top five. I don't care. Oh Lord. Oh God, I hate this song. Please no. No. God, no, not this song. Please not this song. Please not this song. Please. The love of God! For the love of God! What more do you Please! want from me? This goddamn song right here, man. Oh. <laughs> Why? Why? Ugh. Brother, ugh. what's that? What's that, brother? Why? Why you do this, Amir? Why you do this, dog? Why? You played arguably two of the worst fucking songs I don't want to fucking hear, bro. Turn up, dog! Trash ass nigga! We, 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 we gonna have to speed this up. We gonna speed the process up. Fuck that, too. I don't want to hear none of this shit. 
So I got two songs with Bruno Mars as a feature on the man, but he is like one of the go-to people for his songs. First up is Lighters by Bad Meets Evil, and we hit the trees so we look like being the meanest people. This song was the second single to their album, Hell, the sequel, released June 14, 2011. What's y'all favorite song from this album? Because for me, Lighters is not one of my top picks for real. I think the first single, Fast Lane, is better. I even fuck with Above the Law more than Lighters. But Lighter sounds nothing like anything else on this album, and it's clearly the song that Marshall and Royce went into wanting it to be a radio-friendly record. Not that that's a bad thing. Like I mentioned in the intro, I'm not saying that Lighter's being a blatant radio attempt makes it a bad song. The entire track is the fellas rapping about overcoming adversity, living your dreams, not being afraid to take chances, being grateful for what you currently have, and then Bruno coming in with this fantastic ass singer to give the whole track that piano ballad feel. God, no. Oh, no. This song just never hit that hard for me, though. It's cool, but I don't love it. Now, the next track, Mirror with Lil Wayne, this song came out in September 2011 as part of the deluxe edition to the worst Carter album there is, The Carter 4. So, this was three months after Lighters and the Hell to Sequel project came out. These feel like the same damn song, a Bruno Mars singing ballad as a feature with a goat rapper. When it comes to Lighters and Mirror, what's the difference for real? This song goes. That's the purpose of why I hate both of these songs. They sound exactly the same. I hated Lighters and then I hated Mirrors because I'm like, dog, this is the same exact song. It just got Bruno Mars on the cover. And, oh my God, why? Why did these rappers try to take this, I'm trying to be deep and uh, vulnerable with my audience type song? No, nigga. No. 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 Even more into the self-reflection topic, the whole twist with this song is that Wayne starts out implying that he's talking to someone else by telling them that he can see through their lies and see the true hurt and sadness that they've gone through. But then he says, "I'm looking at the man in the mirror." So the entire song is actually Wayne speaking to himself about the things he goes through, correcting himself when he's wrong, admitting his own shame and guilt, etc. This music video is really, really good though. It's very intriguing to look at it from beginning to end. And then, like I said, Bruno Mars coming in singing something else move like. I do think Mirror is slightly, 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 slightly overrated. It is a good track and one of Wayne's most meaningful personal songs to himself, but I do feel like some of the lyrics are very surface level and people make it deeper than what it is. I agree with people who say it's good. You know, it's fire, one of the best songs on C4. Yeah, sure, but I disagree with the bigger positive words when people say mirror is fantastic magnificent or it's a masterpiece of a song that's when i go uh, all right y'all kind of pushing it a little bit but whether you think the song is a masterpiece or if it's just good again mirror was clearly a song that was made to attract casual listeners hell bruno mars as a person was somebody that was made to attract casual listeners all right bro all right bro all right bro <laughs> what John in Tennessee, go ahead. What you want to say? That shit is fucking trash, dog. Get the fuck off the airway. Oh, come uh. on, man. <laughs> hear me and hear me good, nigga. I'm here to double down. That shit is a, a two pack of ass. <laughs> the fuck are you talking about? That shit stinks. What the fuck is this? Not a perfect day. Ah, another dipset, nigga. Don't worry. I don't feel as strongly about Jim Jones as I do about Jew Ass Santana. I did remember not liking his song Pop Champagne for the longest. <laughs> I would rather hear this. I would rather this be on the goddamn list. This is a goddamn banger right here. <laughs> oh, we pop champagne. Oh, I ain't gonna lie though. This this would probably be the only time where Joel said Tether gets the gets the nod for me. As like probably the only bright spot of this song. Cause his verse is the only one I can really remember. <laughs> yo, yo, Ron Browse is the most irrelevant rapper I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> How you sound irrelevant as a rapper, bro? You rap on the song, you just sound irrelevant. I'm listening to the beat more than I'm hearing you, bro. If I'm listening to the beat more than I'm hearing you, that means you are a irrelevant as rapper. Dead ass, bro. And I mean that. Like, when, like, with all my heart, like, nigga, like, ain't no fucking way. You got the Jim Jones part once again. Like, I'm listening to the beat more than I'm listening to your lyrics. Then it gets to, <laughs> it gets to Joel's. It's like, okay, the beat stopped. So I'm not listening to the, I think that's what it was that got me, got my attention. The beat stopped and Joel's was rapping. <laughs> so I was like, hold on. I see you work, see you dance without no shirt. Without those pants, pop champagne and the damn thing chain. <laughs> oh my god. I love this song. I love this song. Even if I don't listen to nobody but Joel Santana on this one, I still love this song. It's still my favorite song. We were singing this song in my eighth grade year of high school, uh, the, uh, middle school. This track has grown on me though. I actually like it now. Now, when it comes to Jim Jones, he's never had a lot of hit songs. He's one of those artists where he's always had high-charting albums. 
from his first album on my way to church all the way to his fourth album pray for rain he's consistently debuted high on the album charts if you're a big jones fan you know his albums are always packed but when it comes to individual records his only two records to ever touch the billboard hot 100 were the previously mentioned pop champagne and of course we fly no lie. the highest you certification that perfect day reached Boy. was it was number 67 on the r&b charts so i guess that's better than nothing perfect day was released as the lead single for his fifth album capo so he started the rollout of this album giving his fans something very different Jimmy has always been your typical rapper telling you tales from his life in the hood, rapping about family, being in clubs, overcoming disrespect, having hoes and whatnot. But for some reason, when it comes to this track, Perfect Day, it's like he became an entirely different person for this one song. This track is Jones singing, not rapping by the way, singing about, I just want to imagine the perfect day where I don't have to go to work, there's no gunshots, there's no people slanging dope on the streets, no drinking, no smoking, just everybody enjoying life and getting money. Although this is a positive topic, it sounds super cheesy because it's Jim Jones for one. All this man talks about is gun bars, smoking haze, and being in the streets. But now suddenly he had a change of heart and he doesn't want any of those things to occur. It's also cheesy because this song sounds like something that would be playing in an ABC family movie. Right. This is essentially the real life version of SpongeBob's best day ever. Y'all remember that SpongeBob song from so long ago when y'all was younger? If you ever wanted to hear a Harlem nigga <laughs> sing about how much he wants to have the greatest day possible, where the birds is chirping, the grass is growing, and there's nothing but rays of sunshine, then here you go. Perfect day will be perfect for you. One acknowledgement I will give him though is for the music video. Throughout the whole thing, in the bottom of the screen, he has sign language interpreters performing the lyrics of the song. Apparently, he did this because one of his close friend's mom is deaf, and it made Jones realize that people don't make videos for the hearing impaired people out there. So it would be very thoughtful if he did this for his video since it helps fit the theme of the song, and he even learned some sign language of his own so that he can do it in his video too. That's beautiful, so I'll give him that. Other than that though, Jim Jones actually has a few songs that were clear radio attempts, so he may make an appearance in part four. I just chose Perfect Day because it's the one that doesn't match him the most. Jim Jones had no business making a song like this. Alrighty, man, that's just going to do it for that one, man. Oh, man, that's just going to do it for this one, man. I will see you on the next video. Shout out to the homie Amir, man. Make sure y'all go subscribe to this channel. Run them likes up, run the views up, run the comments up, and the subscribers up. You already know. They show that love up here. We go show that love right back and all that good stuff. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm sorry, bro. I had I had to speed it up. You was playing arguably two of the worst songs I, I don't want to fucking hear. So I'm sorry. I had to speed it up. I know you probably don't like when I do that, but. You you forced my hand. You forced my hand, Amir. You gave me no chat. You gave me no choice. You gave me no choice. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. You gave me no choice. You told me to watch this. <laughs> you said, hey, I you still ain't gonna react to it. I was like, I said I'll react to it. Cause I'm a man of my word. If I say I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do something. Unless it got something to do with streaming, because you never know. Streaming is optional over here now. I don't do it no more. I don't do it as often no more. It's optional now. If I want to stream, I'll stream. If not, fuck it. I don't care. But anyways, though, that's just going to do it for this one. I'll see you on the next video. Till then, peace out.